go ahead and get started because as usual, it's a pretty full week. I'm imagining a couple more people might dribble in. This is a small group today, but let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, there we go. And Nancy, you may or may not know, but um, the past lectures in this series, because this is week five, they're all recorded and they're on the um, Love Living at Home YouTube channel. Oh, so great. Yeah. If you go in there, you can you can find the past recordings as well. So Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and before we, oops, shoot, you know, I always forget to do this. Let me stop sharing for a minute because I want to turn off my camera so you don't see me waving my hands all over the place. All right, now I'll share my screen. Um, there we go. Before we get started, I just wanted to um, follow up on a, on a question that Peter had um, two or three weeks ago when we were talking about medieval London and we went to the Tower of London and looked at St. Peter at Vincula and I was talking about when they did some restoration work in the early Middle Ages, that church got stained glass windows. And Peter asked at that time, were there windows before? What kind of windows were there? Um, the Saxon churches did have windows. They were very small, as, as I thought, uh, very, very small windows. They didn't have a lot of windows. They did have glazing, so they did have glass. And in fact, when I searched around a little further, I found out, um, particularly through the University of Reading, who had a study on this, that um, obviously there was some glass making going on in the Anglo-Saxon period. I mean, we know the Romans made glass. Uh, but as far back as the 7th century, or the 700s, there was actually some colored glass, they called it colored glass then, being made. But it wasn't, and they were they found some in some churches, not in London, um, but it wasn't very prominent. It wasn't very common until the Middle Ages. But that was that's an answer to Peter, who had a question about that earlier. Um, so first thing I would ask you to do, if you haven't already done so, is please mute your microphones. Uh, at the end of the lecture, as those of you who have been here before know, um, we'll leave some time for questions and, and uh, that sort of thing. But if you could mute your microphones right now, if you haven't done so, that would be great. So this week, we're already at week five, so we're going to be looking at Stuart London. And this was a dynasty that was even shorter than the Tudors' reign, and it was interrupted for a period of 11 years. Now this, this time period, this reign is not as popular as the Tudor period. We talked last week about all these books and movies and TV shows about the Tudors. Um, so this one's not quite as popular in, in popular culture, but there were many, many significant events that took place in London during this time span. So the agenda for today, um, we are going to be looking at a lot of key events. Like I said, a, a lot went on. So this was a time period during which we saw the kingdoms of Scotland and England unite under one monarch. We saw a botched assassination attempt on the first Stuart monarch, um, James VI of Scotland and first of England. Uh, we saw um, his son, James the first son, Charles I, lose his head. We saw a civil war take place. So the execution of a king, which was not done in that time period. And then again, a, a span of time, the interregnum period, when there was no monarchy at all, followed by a restoration of the monarchy with Charles II. Then a great fire in London, another plague, a mini ice age. So all sorts of stuff going on in London uh, during this time. And also this week, we're going to look at architecture. We didn't get to Tudor architecture last time, so we're going to clump together the Tudors and the Stuarts when we look at architecture. But the first thing I wanted to talk about, last week I talked about the population growth in Tudor London, and population continued to surge throughout the Stuart period. From the 1650s, about 10,000 people a year were coming into London to make it their home. And you can see from this chart, which I um, borrowed from Professor Simon Thurley, um, he did this chart showing the span, uh, the growth of cities in Europe um, throughout this time period up to 1750, going all the way back to 1470 to 1750. And you can see that London just takes off on this chart. It just steadily climbing up and up and up in terms of dramatic population growth. 
So let's talk a little bit about the monarchs. Um, as I said last week, this is this is really about the history of London. So I don't go deeply into any of these monarchs, many of these monarchs, um, but I do want to cover um, a few of them. So the last Tudor monarch, Elizabeth I, she was the um, younger daughter of uh, Henry VIII, his and uh, daughter by his second wife Anne Boleyn. She never wed. She had no children. She was you know, popularly known as the Virgin Queen. When she died in 1603, the crown passed to King James VI of Scotland. He was already King of Scotland at this point. And as I said, this marked the unification of Scotland and England under one ruler. Now, how did this Scottish king come to be an English king? He was the great, great grandson of the first tutor, Henry VII. Um, and he was also the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who many of you are probably familiar with. Mary abdicated her throne and went into exile shortly after James's birth. And many, many, many years later, she was subsequently executed by Elizabeth I. So ironically, um, the person who executed her, her son became that, that monarch's successor. James was very intellectual. He was very religious. Uh, he sponsored what we now know as the King James Bible. He was also fascinated with magic, and he was notorious for the hunting and burning of witches. He really had a thing about witches. He even published a treatise on witchcraft. Interestingly enough, James was also way ahead of his time regarding the dangers of tobacco. So again, he published this treatise on tobacco, just as he had on witchcraft. Uh, the work was entitled A Counterblast to Tobacco, and he described it in this work as, and I quote, loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs. So this was a guy way ahead of his time when we think about tobacco. He also believed in the, the absolute right of kings, the divine right of kings. Um, and to that end, he often sought to um, diminish the power of his parliament. And this is an approach that was taken up by his son much, much strongly, more strongly by his son, Charles I, to very disastrous results, as we will see a little bit later. So not long into his reign, an assassination plot was launched against James and his parliament. So what happened was in 1605, Catholic rebels um, launched this plot to basically blow up the House of Lords while parliament was in session. And the, the, the attack was scheduled to take place on the opening day of the House of Lords. And what that meant was, the king would be there, almost all the members of parliament, all of his, you know, his government would be there, probably his heirs would be there. So had they pulled this off, they could have really wreaked havoc. And why was this happening? Well, again, if you recall, when we talked about the Tudors last week, um, there's a lot of hostility and bitter history between the Catholics and Church of England Protestants dating back to the reign of, of Henry VIII uh, and the dissolution of the monasteries. The leader of the rebels for the gunpowder plot was a guy named Robert Catesby. He was a Catholic and his father had been imprisoned for his Catholic beliefs. However, the most famous rebel and the person whose name is attached to this all the time uh, was Guy Fawkes. Fawkes wasn't originally a Catholic. He, be, he was a convert. He became a Catholic convert. He was also a mercenary, so a gun for hire and an explosion uh, explosives expert. So he was in charge of the gunpowder, hence the gunpowder plot. This is how they decided to do it. So basically what they did was they placed 36 barrels of gunpowder in the cellar right beneath where Parliament was meeting. But the plot was foiled thanks to an anonymous letter warning one of the members of Parliament of this impending attack. Somebody sent this guy a letter, the guy went to the king, went to the government and said, there's this attack that's supposed to be taking place. So on November 5th, 1605, Guy Fox was caught red-handed. He was in the cellar guarding the gunpowder, getting ready for this attack, and he was arrested. At the end of that month, on the 30th of January, um, 1606, four of the gunpowder plotters were executed, not at the Tower of London. Again, if you recall, we talked about how a lot of people charged with treason were, were um, housed in the Tower of London. Most of them were executed on Tower Hill next to the Tower of London, some in the grounds of the tower. In this case, they were executed in the courtyard of St. Paul's Cathedral. So a very public, public 
display, uh, and it was intended to warn others of the dire consequences of treason. But this wasn't the only site outside the tower that was used for treasonous executions. Four of the remaining gunpowder plotters, including Guy Fawkes himself, were executed in Old Palace Yard at Westminster Palace. And all of these uh, treasonous individuals were hanged, drawn, and quartered. Now today, of course, um, there is uh, Guy Fawkes Day, more commonly known as Bonfire Night now. Uh, it's celebrated every November 5th all across uh, England. There are bonfires, there are fireworks. They used to burn effigies of the guy, as they said. I don't even know if they do that anymore, but the bonfire, the fireworks have really become a big thing. Um, so it's still, still marked to this day. Okay, that brings us to James the first son, Charles the uh, first. He succeeded James in 1625. And after taking the throne, he became increasingly unpopular for a variety of reasons not the least of which was his adherence to this principle of the divine right of kings that I mentioned a minute ago. Now, this was the belief that the monarch is chosen by and answerable only to God. So not to parliament, not to his subjects, only to God. And actually, this was not a new concept. Uh, even during the War of the Roses, both Henry VI and Edward IV claimed they were chosen by God to rule. So this goes back. This goes back a ways. So what happened was Charles dissolved Parliament three times between 1625 and 1629. And then for 11 years, from 1629 to 1640, he ruled without Parliament at all, without consulting Parliament at all. So he was doing things like imposing taxes without parliamentary consent. And again, this was something you didn't do. When you wanted to raise taxes for your army, for whatever, you had to get the, the consent of parliament. You had to ask parliament for the money, basically. And, and Charles didn't do this. So this made him very unpopular. He was also married to um, Henrietta Maria. She was the Roman Catholic sister of the King of France. So he was regarded as being overly loyal to the Pope and to France. He, he wasn't Catholic, he was Church of England but he was seen as being potentially too loyal to France. France was always fighting with England. Um, and of course, France being Catholic, um, being loyal to the Pope and having a French wife, which was not popular. Also, um, Charles, although he wasn't Catholic, he was what we called a high Anglican. So his th that type of Anglicanism was closer to Catholicism. They didn't believe in the Pope and that sort of thing, but they honed a little closer to the practices of Catholicism. Uh, so he had his own way of thinking about some of this, and he attempted to force the Church of Scotland to adopt high Anglican practices. This really caused a problem. The Church of Scotland was very independent um, on, on how they ran themselves. So they were not at all happy by this guy, this English king, even though he had Scottish heritage and was you know, king as well. Um, they weren't happy about the king trying to impose his beliefs on them. And this led to something called the Bishop's War. Um, I'm not gonna get into that. There's no time to get into that, but basically that was the precursor for what kind of finally launched the English Civil War and eventually Charles's demise. So Charles had, had a lot of stuff going against him. And that brings us to the English Civil Wars. You'll see that's plural because there were a series of wars. There wasn't just one. But basically, these wars were fought between people loyal to the monarchy, called royalists, and those who were loyal to parliament, called parliamentarians. And eventually, the parliamentarian army would be led by a guy named Oliver Cromwell. He was a member of parliament, a very um, astute um, military leader. Uh, and eventually he became the Lord Protector in England when the monarchy was dissolved for a while. So talking about London, um, London during the war, Parliament controlled London during the English Civil War. So what happened was um, Charles and his his court sort of decamped. They went off to Oxford. They, they, they went out of the city. Uh, so Parliament was in control of London. So they had the wealth of the city. As we know, it was a very, very wealthy city. So from the start of the Civil War, the city of London, that one square mile I had talked about the first few weeks of the class, um, they were on the side of the parliamentarians. Basically, all of London was, was under uh, the parliamentarians. And there were basic um, defenses starting to be erected. They put them around the city gates, those old Roman walls, um, the city gates, 
and near the riverside. They also prepared chains and they said, okay, we can string the chains across the roads to hamper any advance by the Royalist army if the Royalist army tries to get back in here. It's estimated that the city had in total about 12,000 people, um, 12 regiments. Um, so they had 12,000 people and 12 regiments to man the barricades, as it were, the barriers. And about seven months into the war in March of 1643, Parliament made plans for even more robust defenses. This was an incredibly expensive undertaking and the cost fell on the city of London and Westminster. So it was costing the, the city a lot of money. So basically they built this huge earth wall about three times longer than the Roman wall and physically much, much bigger. Uh, and they, they built a substantial ditch and a moat fortification outside the wall. And at the time, the wall actually ran beyond the perimeters of Stuart London. Um, it actually, it ran out into what we now think of today as Greater London. And it was thought to have been the largest fortification of its type in Europe. There were stone reinforced gates. There were several forts dotted along the wall at, at key locations. And volunteers, and I put that in quotes because you didn't really have a choice, volunteers were recruited to work on these defensive structures, building these structures. So each of the livery companies, if you recall, when we were talking about the medieval guilds and the livery that became the livery companies, each of those companies had to close down for a day, close down their work for a day, whether they be tailors or potters or whoever they were, and they had to all work together to work on this defense. Contemporary reports suggest around 100,000 men worked on the fortification at various times. Um, so this was a big, big, big undertaking. And the map here, you can see, um, even though this was on a huge scale, the details about it are, are still kind of sketchy because once the war was over, this whole thing was demolished. Um, so there's nothing above ground to, to kind of indicate where it once stood. But we do have some accounts and we have some maps to kind of get an idea of the fortification. So this is one example of that. And you can see, um, let me go down here and... Kind of, you can see here the kind of fortifications, the little forts all along here, kind of showing you where they are. And then here's another one that's a little clearer, kind of overlaid on a, on a modern map now of London. But again, you can see um, where the fortifications were and where the wall, they think the wall kind of ran around. So in 1645, Oliver Cromwell, um, He's heading up the, the uh, army. He established a full-time and professional fighting force, which would become known as the New Model Army. Now, this initially consisted of around 20,000 men split into 11 regiments. But unlike older militias, what would happen in the past when, when there was any fighting going on, the lords scattered around the country would, would get militias together. Um, and they would support the king and they would, you know, get the arms together and stuff. But they were kind of, I, I don't want to say a ragtag bunch, but they were all kind of autonomous, independent militias. In this case, these were trained fighting men that were able to go anywhere in the country. So it was the first really full-time professional fighting force. And they did quite well. They saw a lot of victories. Uh, and in the 1650s, they had garrisons, not only in England, but Scotland and Ireland, so they were expanding their reach and their authority um, out to the rest of the British Isles for the first time. And they also held Puritan religious beliefs. Oliver Cromwell didn't start out as a Puritan, but um, became a Puritan later in life. So they held um, those beliefs as well, a lot of the people in the army. So Charles was captured in 1646. He managed to escape but he was subsequently captured again. And by 1648, Oliver Cromwell's army really did have firm control over England. They, were, they had really taken the lead on this. Charles was accused of treason against England because it was said that he was using his power as king to follow personal interests instead of the interests that were the good of the country. And in January of 1649, he was put on trial at Westminster Hall and he was sentenced to death. Three days after his sentencing, so this happened quite quickly, he was beheaded outside Banqueting House, which was part of Whitehall Palace. And we're going to look at Banqueting House uh, a little bit later. 
Now, on the day of his execution, he was he was being kept um, at the very end over by St. James Palace, in St. James Palace, over by Buckingham Palace, if you know Buckingham Palace today. Um, and he walked down, he was marched down from St. James Palace um, through the parks over to Whitehall Palace. It was January, it was cold. And he asked for an extra shirt to wear because he said, I don't want spectators to think that I am shivering because I'm a coward. It was cold out and he didn't want people to think he was being a coward. His execution was met with horror by rulers in Europe. Remember, this is before the French Revolution. This just wasn't the done thing. Kings got killed in kind of sneaky manners sometimes, but you didn't execute an anointed and crowned king. So people were um, quite shocked by this. Now, just across the street from Banqueting House um, stands the Horse Guards, and you can see this clock tower here over the main archway, and it has a black dot over the, the Roman numeral two there. That was said to be, and again, we don't know if this is, this is true or not, this could be another London myth, but it was supposedly denoting the time of Charles's execution, and it's facing right over to where he was executed. So that leads us to the interregnum period that went on from 1649 to 1660. So right after Charles's death, the UK was run by a rump parliament, and that parliament basically oversaw both the executive and legislative functions of the government. But then it was decided to replace the monarchy totally with a Commonwealth Republic, and this was headed by Oliver Cromwell as the Lord Protector. You can see Cromwell on the left here. You can also see a statue of him here on the right um, in front of the Houses of Parliament. So he was named Lord Protector. It was said he wasn't all that keen on being Lord Protector. And one, at one point they wanted him to be king. They asked him to be king and he said no, he refused the crown. Um, but nonetheless, he did take on the role of Lord Protector. And in 1653, um, Parliament had been dissolved and Cromwell was named Lord Protector for life. And one of the things he said when he took the job, if you will, was, okay, I'll do this, but I get to name my successor. So he had the role for life and he ruled the UK, he, he ruled more or less with the same powers as a monarch, quite frankly. He was a very controversial figure. He was of course hated by the Royalists for his role in the trial and execution of Charles I. He was also pretty unpopular with many parliamentarians who felt that he himself was a tyrant, that he wasn't that much different than the king. He basically replaced the monarchy with a puritanical republic. So many of the leisure activities that Londoners had come accustomed to, to enjoy, as we talked about last time, like theater, these were all banned as being sinful. In addition, he conducted bloody campaigns in both Ireland and Scotland uh, and, and in Ireland, he suppressed the Catholic faith. He seized vast amounts of land. His name is still pretty much mud in, in Ireland today. After he died, his son Richard became Lord Protector because he, he got to name his own successor. But unlike uh, Oliver Cromwell, Richard did not have great military and political skills. His father did, Richard didn't. Richard was pretty weak. Uh, I think actually Oliver even had an older son, and I'm not sure why he chose Richard over the older son, but he did. Um, Richard had a lot of problems. He didn't get along with the army. He didn't get along with parliament. Uh, the new model army who had, you know, still had Oliver Cromwell kind of at their head, they were really suffering now without that leadership. There were repeated purges. There were reorganizations. You started seeing a breakdown in the cohesion of the unit without having this, you know, Oliver at their helm. So the army just continued to erode and erode. And finally, Richard was forced to abdicate. So at this point, England's really sliding into disarray. Most Englishmen were saying, you know something, uh, maybe better the devil you know, you know, maybe that monarchy thing didn't look so bad after all. And in April, 1660, um, they decided, let's, you know, make in real, let's see if we can invite uh, this uh, Charles I son who had was living in exile in Europe, you know, maybe, maybe we should invite him over to be king. So in April 1660, the Declaration of Breda was issued by the future Charles II, and in it he promised a general pardon for actions committed during the civil wars and the interregnum period, with the exception of the regicides, the, the people who killed his father, signed the death warrant and killed his father. 
He promised the retention by the current owners of property purchased during the English Civil Wars and interregnum. So if land had been taken away from somebody and someone else bought it, he said, okay, I'm going to leave it in your hands. I'm not going to give it back to the original owners. He promised religious tolerance um, to try to smooth the waters with all of this. And very, very importantly, he promised to pay arrears to the army because that was the other problem with the army is they had not been paid in a very long time. And he said, I'll take care of that. The army will be paid. So this, this all looks good to people. Parliament said, okay, we'll agree to these terms. They resolved to proclaim him king and they invited him to return to England. So he left Holland where he was in exile on the 24th of May. He entered London five days later on his 30th birthday came in right on his 30th birthday. So the country had gone through three civil wars in about 20 years by the time Charles II lands in, comes to London. All of the wars finally did end with the restoration of the monarchy. But by this point, over 200,000 people were dead, either from battle or from starvation and sickness brought on by the wars. Now, less than a year later, and 12 years to the day of Charles I's execution, Oliver Cromwell's body was exhumed and subject to a posthumous execution. He had been buried in Westminster Abbey. He had a state funeral. Again, he kind of lived like a king. He was living at Hampton Court Palace. It was said that he sat on a throne when he met with people. Um, although he didn't make a lot of money out of, out of this venture. And again, he, he didn't want to be king. He said he was not going to be called king, but he was living pretty well. But his body was exhumed and subject to this, post, uh, um, um, this execution. He was beheaded. His body was thrown in a pit. Um, the head ended up supposedly, there's still a lot of controversy about where his head ended up. It bounced all over the country for a while. Supposedly, it's now at Sydney Sussex College uh, in Oxford. Um, don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they're saying. That, that, that's what they're claiming at this point. Um, and when we look at his legacy, depending on your point of view, <laughs> where you're sitting, uh, Oliver Cromwell was either regarded as a traitor or a hero or a dictator or noble or a tyrant. And the, the statue on the right here that I mentioned before in 1899, this statue was erected outside of Parliament to commemorate the 300th anniversary of his birth. And even that was very controversial at that time. There were members of the government who said, yes, we believe in freedom from you know, tyranny. And, and so they thought he was great. There were other members on the other side of the government who said, no, 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 we should not be putting a statue up to this man. No surprise, the Irish Nationalist Party um, really uh, kicked up a fuss about it. And they blocked public funding. There was going to be public funding for the statue. And they said, absolutely not. We're not going after public funding. So it was erected, but it was erected with private donations. And interestingly enough, just a little aside to this too, right near Westminster Abbey, so right near the Houses of Parliament, is St. Margaret's Church. And Cromwell's statue is facing St. Margaret's Church. And on the wall of St. Margaret's Church, on the outside wall, um, facing Cromwell, is a bust of Charles I. So the two enemies are kind of looking at each other. All right, that brings us to this guy I just mentioned, Charles II. He was the eldest surviving son of Charles I. He was only eight years old when the Civil War first broke out. He eventually again took refuge uh, in, in France and then Holland. The Scots, even though they weren't happy with with Charles I imposing his version of religion on the church there, nonetheless, they were horrified uh, when he was executed, when Charles I was executed. After all, the Stuarts were Scottish, right? Um, and when England was becoming a republic, the Scots said, no, 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 um, we're not recognizing that. We're naming Charles I's son, Charles II, as our king. And they invited him to come to Scotland on January 1st, 1651, they crowned him at Schoon. This turned out to be the last coronation at Schoon. This is where um, Scottish monarchs were crowned. In July, the New Model Army marched into Scotland. They went into Fife. They captured Perth. Uh, meanwhile, the Scottish forces were coming south into England, but they were, they were defeated uh, at the Battle of Worcester. Uh, on the 3rd of September of 1651. Charles II of Scotland, not yet of England, made a miraculous escape, um, supposedly hid in a tree before escaping. 
and going back to France. Now, I did a whole lecture on the, the stewards. So again, that's on the Love Living at Home YouTube channel. So if you want more information about the war, about these monarchs, there's more information in that lecture. Uh, as again, as I said, I just need to skim over these people today. So Charles II comes back. He returns to England on his 30th birthday, and he had a second coronation. He had had the coronation in Scotland. Now he had one at Westminster Abbey. But Oliver Cromwell, during the interregnum period, had destroyed nearly all of the medieval coronation regalia. The only thing surviving, I believe, is a medieval spoon that's used for the, for the holy oil, for the anointing. Everything else was destroyed. It was melted down. The jewels were sold. Everything pretty much disappeared, most of it. So a whole new set that's still used to this day, that was used for Charles III's coronation um, very recently, um, a whole new set had to be created for Charles II. And that's the regalia there. So when people think of Charles II, if you know him at all, if, if you know his name at all, uh, his reputation is you know, one of accumulating mistresses. And he did, he had two illegitimate children by his favorite mistress. Um, one of whom was born after his marriage to the Portuguese princess, Catherine of Braganza. He also had other illegitimate kids scattered around. He definitely liked the good life. His court was associated with debauchery and excess, and he was dubbed the Merry Monarch. But he also heralded a huge social change from the interregnum period. So remember last week when we were talking about Tudor pastimes and I mentioned animal blood sports. Well, they had been banned under Oliver Cromwell they came back full force. Theaters were reopened. And most significantly, women were on stage for the first time. Up until this point, women's roles had been played by young boys. So for the first time, you're seeing women on stage, which was also scandalous. Theater was still very scandalous at this time. So I'm not gonna talk any more about Charles's reign per se, but there were some very significant events that I want to highlight that took place during his reign and that he had a hand in, in dealing with. So let's look at some of these. We're back to plagues again, <clears throat> just as we were before. So plagues during the medieval period continued to bedevil London right up to the middle of the 17th century. The last great plague of its type was this one in 1665. It was a devastating event for the city of London. It wiped out tens of thousands of people. Now, this, the city had experienced two major plague epidemics in 1603 and 1625, but this one, more people had died than, than ever before. The population, as I mentioned earlier, was growing. So in, in, 600, in 1600, it was about 200,000. But by 1650, it was 350,000. So again, growing rapidly. And just as we saw with the medieval plagues, with the great pestilence, this led to overcrowding uh, and that encouraged the spread of disease. From the first plague death that was recorded, which was in May of 1665 uh, in London, the bills of mortality allow us to trace the disease's impact. And these are really fantastic documents. And I'll talk about those in a second. So basically what you had was you had people dying or fleeing the city, getting out of the city. Um, think about the early days of COVID in New York City when a lot of people went upstate. Uh, and the economic life of London was very badly affected, as were cities here. Uh, a minister named Thomas Vincent at that time, he witnessed, I quote, uh, a deep silence almost in every place, especially within the walls, within that one square mile, the walled city. No rattling coaches, no prancing horses, no calling in customers, no offering wares. So again, just like our early days when the streets were pretty much deserted and everything was closed. This plague killed very quickly, very painfully. Dr. Nathaniel Hodges, again, a, a contemporary at that time, um, gave a description of the symptoms which included unquenchable thirst within, dryness, blackness of the tongue. And then there were other uh, symptoms including vomiting, delirium, swelling of the lymph nodes, Pretty nasty stuff. These were the bills of mortality I was talking about. For historians, we love nothing more than these. These are just fabulous. This was the parish clerk's bills of mortality, and they're the closest thing we have to accurate statistics about the disease. Recording causes of death and the numbers of burials parish by parish, week by week, they really help us understand the spread of plague across the city. 
Now these bills were printed, uh, they were published in big print runs. They cost about a penny to buy. So anybody could buy them, the public, they were available to the public to buy on the streets. And the other side of the bills contained information on deaths broken down parish by parish. So you could see how, how each parish was affected. They also acted as an early warning system for outbreaks of plague uh, at this time period in 1665. So basically the king, working with the Lord Mayor of London, they would see these bills of mortality before the public and they could kind of take swift action to close up any infected houses, to see which neighborhoods, which parishes were being affected, to see which direction it was spreading in. So the king was involved with this early on, on trying to help contain this. In addition to the immense toll of the plague, these documents are really interesting because they show the high rate of infant mortality. The youngest Londoners died so often, their deaths were categorized according to their age rather than the disease that might have killed them. So they were, um, let me go again and zoom in on this so you can see this. So you see crimsons, this is crimsons here, and you see 15 deaths. Those refer to infants younger than a month old. And then on the other side, there are teeth. That's not teeth, tooth infections. 113 died. These were babies who were not through with their teething yet. So that's how there were, there were so many deaths of infants that they, that's how they broke them up. But it is very interesting to look at some of the, um, some of the ways, some of the um, reasons they gave for death. Um, fright, their fright, fright was in here someplace. Frightened, frightened. Um, I felt sorry for this individual, killed by a fall down the stairs at St. Thomas Apostle. I'm like, boy, there's a huge plague going on, killing everyone, and you die by falling downstairs. That's ironic and rather sad. Um, but th these are really, really great documents. Here's another one. This is uh, cleaned up, obviously, easier to read. And there's some very, again, interesting terminology used in here. So if we go up to um, cancer up here, um, cancer and, oops, one, two, cancer and wolf. <laughs> so wolf meant a tumor. Um, and there's a whole glossary to understand what some of these, some of these things mean, um, but quite, quite interesting, quite fascinating to look at. The Guildhall Library in the city of London holds the fullest set of the bills of mortality in the world. They go back to 1532 and all the way up to 1858. So this wasn't something that started with the plague. This started before. The Welcome Library in London has made more than 100,000 of its medical history images available for free download. And amongst those are a handful of these, these bills of mortality from 1664 and 1665. So if you really are curious about this, you can go to the Welcome Library website. You can search under bills of mortality and, and read through some of these things. And you'll see it's also telling you how many were buried, how many were from the plague, how many were men, how many were women, that kind of thing. Now, having said all this, and they really are our best source, the bills are not totally reliable because what would happen was the government hired, the city hired searchers. These were people that were employed to go house to house and determine the causes of death. They were usually poor old women and they were kind of forced by the parish authorities to do this job in exchange for food and clothing. So usually poor old women that had no other choice in life um, so they were sent out to do this. They didn't have any medical training. They their di they couldn't make diagnoses. So the, their you know their diagnoses were not necessarily accurate. And these women were also susceptible to bribes because bribes <laughs> because any house affected by the plague, um, even if you had healthy individuals still living in that house, that house was shut up for forty days. Everybody had to go into quarantine for forty days. So when the women would come around to determine the cause of death of someone who died in the house. Some of these householders would say, I'll give you money to say it was something else because I don't want to be locked up for 40 days. So they were susceptible to bribes. And then, of course, the other problem was some of these deaths were recorded under the symptoms of plague, such as vomiting and fever. So someone could have died of a non-plague related cause or the vomiting and fever could have actually been the plague. So there could be more plague deaths. We don't know. The, the, the registered number, the official number was 68,596 in London. But there are historians who are arguing it was probably closer to 100,000. So we, we really don't know. But these records um, did allow uh, authorities to start thinking about the spread and how this was happening. 
Orders were drawn up and issued by the Lord Mayor and the Aldermen of the City of London um, concerning the infection of the plague. They used some of their findings and some of their decisions based on versions from earlier plagues. There were instructions for preventing the spread of disease. So how you would deal with beggars on the street, because again, people, you know, there were homeless people on the streets. Uh, they suspended theater productions to, dis to discourage large gatherings. Again, like here, things shut down. Movement was strictly controlled. So anyone leaving the city had to have a certificate of health. And houses affected by the plague, as I said before, were shut up for 40 days, whether somebody was no longer sick in there or not. Some of the sick, particularly those on the street, homeless ones, did go to pest houses. They were kind of a hospital for those with infectious diseases. But there weren't very many of these in London. They were few and far between. Uh, and then there were other orders written up on, you know, how do you bury the bodies? How do you keep the streets clean? That kind of thing. So the king was was involved with, with some of this, along with the Lord Mayor. We get through the plague, and then darn if London doesn't get hit again. So and now I want to talk about something you've heard me mention a few times, and I'm sure this one might be somewhat familiar to some of you, and that is the Great Fire of 1666. It started on Sunday, September 2nd, 1666, in a bakery on Pudding Lane, or some are now saying near Pudding Lane, but it doesn't matter. We'll call it Pudding Lane. And it was believed that a spark jumped from the hearth of this bakery and set the bakery, which was connected to the baker's house, on fire. The baker was a guy named Thomas um, Fariner. Uh, he, his daughter, and his manservant, they managed to escape through a bedroom window in the house. But the household maid was afraid to jump out the window, it was said, and she died in the fire. So she was considered the first victim of what became known as the Great Fire of 1666. Now, house fires were not uncommon in this age. Every home had open fires. People left candles burning near their beds. Maybe they fell asleep before they put the candle out or the candle would fall out of the candle holder. Uh, people also aired their clothes next to the open fires. And if your clothes got too close, they would catch on fire. So it wasn't unusual for fires, house fires. It also wasn't unusual for a fire to consume streets or even entire districts. Because again, remember, especially within that walled one square mile, houses were crammed together very, very closely. But what made this fire especially devastating, there are a few things. The summer of 1666 had been really hot and dry. So these timber buildings, these were mostly all timber, they were bone dry. And the area in the vicinity of the fire was also filled, especially when you got down near the river, with warehouses containing rope, timber, oil, pitch. All of these things were highly combustible. In 1979, archaeologists ex excavated the remains of a burnt out shop on Pudding Lane, not far from the bakery. Uh, and they found in the cellar the charred remnants of 20 barrels of tar. Tar burns very, very easily. So that would have helped spread the fire. And then to make matters even worse, you've got the dry conditions, you've got the combustible uh, ingredients. There was a gale force wind, a huge storm. So this gale force wind was coming up the English Channel and it hit London right when the fire started in the bakery. So it was the perfect storm in terms of events. And then finally, there was said to be a disastrous failure of leadership. So as the fire began to spread, parish constables, they went to the London's, to London's Lord Mayor, a guy named Thomas Bloodworth. They woke him up in the middle of the night. They said, look, we're really worried about this. It looks like this fire could get out of control. And they wanted to pull down buildings to create a fire break, but they needed his permission to do so. And the story goes, he got up, he went out with them into the streets to look at the fire. And pardon my French, <laughs> he was supposedly said, a woman could piss this out, this is nothing, and he went back to sleep. Now there's some feeling that maybe he was uh, unfairly blamed for this, but again, that's that's the best story we have right now, was that he did not take firm action. We know he didn't take firm action, regardless of what he said, he didn't take firm action at that time. So if we look at the timeline here, starts on Sunday, September 2nd, in the bakery. By early morning, over 300 houses were on fire, uh, the, the fire spread to the Star Inn. It set fire to hay in the yard. It continued down Fish Street near London Bridge. It destroyed the Church of St. Magnus Martyr. Uh, it, it, when it reached Thames Street, that's where all the wharfs were, and everything went up because you had tar and hemp and flax, highly combustible materials. So by daybreak, 300 houses were burning, no sign of the scale wind diminishing. 
And Samuel Pepys, the noted diarist, he climbed the tower of All Hallows by the Tower. And we talked about All Hallows by the Tower in the medieval uh, week. And I told you that played a kind of a role in this or a bird's eye view because he climbed the tower and he watched the progress of the fire across the city from there. His house was very near to the tower. He was actually right out of the fire, very, very close to the fire, but just missed the fire. He was just to the east of it. He also hired a boat and he sailed upriver to see what was happening. He found that the north bank of the Thames was on fire from these warehouses. Small boats were clustered around the stairs and the quays where people were trying to save their goods. So they were throwing them into waiting boats or if there are no boats available, they were literally throwing their household goods into the river to try to save them. And as the fire spread, so did rumors that the fire was deliberately set, either by the Dutch, because the England had been at war, it was at war with Holland at this point, so either by the Dutch or by French Jesuits. Now, none of this was true, none of it, uh, none of it was ever proven, but nonetheless, a wave of violence broke out all over the city. So you had mobs roaming the streets and attacking anyone, Dutch, Portuguese, French, Flemish, anyone who looked or sounded like an outsider. We get to Monday, government buildings start to burn, including the Great Letters Office. London did not have a fire brigade in 1666, so Londoners themselves had to fight the fire helped by local soldiers. And they used buckets of water, they used water squirts for like these big implements. They were kind of like hoses, but you pushed something up through them to push the water out. They used fire hooks to try to pull down houses, again, to make fire breaks. That was thought to be the best way to stop the fire was pulling down these houses with hooks to make these gaps. But it, it was made more difficult because the wind was so strong still, the fire just swept through any of the gaps that were created. Charles II was involved by this point, the king was involved, and he put his brother, his younger brother, James Duke of York, in charge of the firefighting. So both James and Charles were on the scene of these fires. Fire posts were created each staffed by 130 men, and they were set up all around the fire, uh, around the city, to try to help fight the blaze. By Tuesday, it was determined that maybe a better way to, um, to stop this fire is to actually blow up houses with gunpowder. So, which seems counterproductive, but I, so near that Tower of London, it, the fire never got to the Tower of London, but it got near, um, houses were demolished with gunpowder. And you had military engineers coming in, beginning to blow up streets around the Tower of London. So to try to contain this fire from going any further east, uh, eastward. And preparations at that time were made for the court to be evacuated from Whitehall Palace in London to Hampton Court, which was about 30 miles away, I think. Now, the same day uh, as Whitehall was being, uh, being evacuated, um, fire broke out on the roof of St. Paul's Cathedral. And within 30 minutes, you had molten lead cascading into the nave of the cathedral. It split open the stonework, this old medieval cathedral, uh, crashed through the floor. Everything crashed through the floor right into the crypt. Again, made worse by the fact that St. Paul's Cathedral was known as this area around here. Lots of book printers, lots of paper makers. People would sell their books, sell their wares in the courtyard of St. Paul's Cathedral. And when the fire started, they all said, hey, where is the safest place to keep our goods? In the crypt of the church. This is a gigantic, we're going to talk about St. Paul's in a little bit, gigantic medieval church, stone church. Nothing's going to happen to this. It's going to be safe. Well, they were wrong. So the crypt was filled with all of this stuff. And of course, when everything caved in, um, the, there was this huge roar. The whole medieval cathedral went up um, like a bomb. The entire sky was lit up. Uh, it was said that the moon turned blood red. And if you think again about what our skies looked like this past summer with the, with the fires uh, in Canada, and those were hundreds of miles away, but you know, for a couple of days there, our skies looked pretty weird. Um, you can just imagine what it looked like around London. And even 40 miles away in Oxford, they said you could see the glow of the fire um, from this. So it was quite devastating. In the meantime, public order broke down even further. We talked about these mobs wandering around attacking people. Looting was widespread. People were stealing from shops, warehouses, private residences. You started seeing vast refugee camps springing up in the fields outside of London because people had run from their homes or lost their homes. So they were sheltering in tents and in shacks. 
Some people had to live like this for months, some even for years. Now, by Tuesday night, the wind had finally dropped and firefighters began to gain, uh, gain control of this fire. So we get to Wednesday, most of the fire is extinguished. Samuel Pepys surveyed the damage again. He walked around uh, the, the burnt out area and he talked about this in his diaries. Now, despite the fire being totally extinguished by Thursday, the next day, London smoldered for weeks afterwards. And also, despite King Charles announcing that the fire was an accident and not a foreign plot, uh, conspiracy theories smoldered for decades, much longer than the fire did. A plaque in Pudding Lane at one point that was up there said that here by the permission of, permission of heaven, hell broke loose upon this Protestant city from the malicious hearts of barbarous papists. That was later taken down. So stats, the Great Fire lasted just under five days. Four fifths of the city was destroyed. Again, that one square mile we're talking about. Um, 100,000 people were left homeless. More than 13,000 houses were lost uh, in the fire. Dozens of public buildings and government buildings. So the customs house where customs and duties were collected, that was gone. So that affected London's position as uh, you know, with the country's major port, because that was their major port. The General Letters Office, as I mentioned, that disrupted communications with the rest of England, and the Royal Exchange was also destroyed. 82% of the churches um, were destroyed within the city of London, so there are about 109, and if my math is right, I think there were 89 that were destroyed, including St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, remarkably, they were said to only be a handful of fatalities, throughout all of this, but the long-term effects on the survivors was really telling. Uh, Samuel Pepys suffered nightmares for months. He talks about this in his diaries. He said his wife's hair fell out from the stress of this and both complained of stomach problems. So this had a, a long reaching effect on London for some time. So here you can see the spread of the fire starting um, on Monday starting on Sunday down here, and it went mostly westward. It crept a little bit eastward, and you can see it almost made it to the Tower of London, but not quite. But pretty much the way the winds were blowing, the way things were going, it was really going um, to the west and to the north for the most part. And this again kind of shows you um, where the fire spread was. It went outside the walls to the west, but pretty much contained in the walls for the rest of it. And there's Peep's house right there. So he came very, very close. And there's Pudding Lane where the fire was said to have started and St. Paul's, which was destroyed. And this shows you some of the buildings that survived. So if you recall, we went to St. Bartholomew's the Great. We went to the Charter House. They both survived this fire. The Guild Hall, which we talked about, that survived the fire. Uh, All Hollows, which we visited, survived the fire. And obviously the Tower of London, as well as a few other places. So one week after the final flames had gone out, Charles II issued a proclamation and he promised a much more beautiful city than is at this time consumed. He outlined his wish to impose order and direction. He, he said, we're gonna have main thoroughfares like Cheapside and Cornhill, the, the main thoroughfares in the city of London. They're going to be of such breadth as may with God's blessing prevent the mischief that one side may suffer if the other be on fire. So he really wanted to widen these, these narrow medieval streets. So if one side had caught on fire, it wasn't gonna jump over to the other side. Christopher Wren, uh, whose name you might be familiar with, and we're gonna be talking about him more. He was a professor of astronomy at Oxford. He had a big interest in the science of architecture. He was among the first to submit a proposal because the king said, okay, bring me your proposals about how we rebuild the city. And he wanted to kind of, again, he, he agreed with the king, we need to have wider streets. He wanted to have these monumental avenues that were radiating kind of from piazzas, classic buildings, formal street plans. These were things he had studied in Paris and Rome. They were big influences on him. And you can see his plan here. Charles II really admired Wren's designs and he made him one of the six commissioners appointed to oversee the rebuilding works. But unlike in Lisbon, where the Portuguese king ordered a completely new city after the earthquake there in 1755, Charles did not get a chance to build the city that he wanted to. 
because you had property owners who were asserting their rights. And they said, wait a minute, this is our land. You know, we, we own this, pro this, this patch of land, even though stuff burned down, you can't just come in here and change things. Um, so that caused a, a real problem. Uh, and they started building again on these previous medieval street patterns. And then also there really wasn't any appetite for this. There was no money. England was at war with the Dutch. So there wasn't any money. Um, and to get involved, you know, they had to get involved with these legal battles with London's wealthy merchants. So that was a problem. So in the end, the only thing that happened was the king insisted that the old roads be slightly widened and that building standards be improved. In 1667, February, a, fork, uh, a fire court was put together, and that was to kind of sort out all of these remaining legal disputes going on. And then a rebuilding act was passed to regulate the height of new buildings, so the new buildings could not be more than four stories. And uh, timber exteriors were banned for obvious reasons, no more timber exteriors. It took 50 years to rebuild the city. Only 51 churches and about 9,000 houses were rebuilt. So for that reason, today, there's only a tiny proportion of pre-1700 London that still exists today. All right, so the Great Fire Monument, I want to talk about a couple of uh, nods to the Great Fire. The Great Fire Monument is just around the corner from Pudding Lane. It was designed by Christopher Wren, the same man that um, came up with this grandiose plan to rebuild the city, and by uh, Robert Hooke, another prominent um, architect. It was erected in 1677. It's 202 feet high. It's open to the public. You can go all the way up to the top here, get really great views from the top. And there's this engraving on the side. And this engraving um, on the side of the monument, it's an allegorical design. And it displays, I'm going to bring this up again a little bit. This female figure here, this represents the city of London. She looks ruined, right? She looks exhausted. Uh, behind her, time is trying to lift her up with his wings. And then you see this other this other figure at her side kind of touching her and trying to give her encouragement and pointing up here to these two goddesses um, up here in the sky. Over here, you've got Charles II dressed as a Roman emperor, and he's leading he's leading his attendants in to to start trying to save the city. You can see the flames here and the flames here. And you can also see workmen already working to try to uh, rebuild the city. And then the other one, this one's, this one's um, kind of amusing. This is the golden boy um, of Pie Corner. And I always get a little bit of a chuckle out of the golden boy of Pie Corner because uh, in this case, um, we don't, we're not sure when this was put up. We know that it was in place by the late 1700s, and then sometime in the 1800s, it was covered in gold and called the Golden Boy. And again, if I zoom in, you can see the inscription says, this boy is in memory put up for the late fire of London occasioned by the sin of gluttony in 1666. So you had people blaming foreigners and foreign plots, and you also had people saying, no, this was God punishing you because you are gluttonous people. But I did want to talk about those foreigners again for a minute because one uh, one victim of this fire, this is a very tragic story, was a 26-year-old Frenchman named um, Robert Hubert. He was from Normandy and he was arrested after the Great Fire on suspicion of attempting to flee the country. He consequently, uh, he, he ultimately uh, confessed to starting the fire. And he said, I was one of 23 conspirators he said he'd gone to Sweden with an accomplice and returned to London in August. He said the accomplice had taken him to the bakery and he had put a large fireball through the window of the bakery and that's what started the whole fire. But his, there was a lot of holes in his evidence. Number one, it conflicted with other accounts he gave. And even Thomas um, Fariner and his family who did blame Hubert for the fire, I mean, they, they swore up and down, all the fire, this did not come from a hearth. You know, we had everything out. We checked carefully before we went to bed. This was not our fault. Of course, they don't want to be blamed for it. The whole city burned down, right? Um, so they said, yeah, yeah, it was. It had to have been this guy. It wasn't us. But even that baker admitted there was no window where Hubert claimed he had thrown, he had thrown this fireball through. No trace of Hubert's accomplices were ever found. The only evidence other than his confession 
was that he could find the site of the house among the ruins. He knew where the bakery was, even after it had burned down. And he could describe the house as it had looked, even though he got the window wrong. So that, that did not help him. The court found the evidence to be unsatisfactory. They believed Hubert to be suffering from mental problems. But there was public pressure. They wanted to blame somebody for this. And so he was convicted and executed by, um, by being hanged. And that was really sad because what we found out later, after the fact, actually, was the Swedish captain of the ship uh, who brought Uber to London, he testified that the ship hadn't even landed until two days after the fire started. And again, in as I said before, in January of 1667, the King's Council declared that the fire was an accident. But what you see here, um, I put this up here. This is this is a front piece for a piece of propaganda work um, called the um, Pyrotechnica Loyolana, Ignatian Fireworks, or the Fiery Jesuits' Temper and Behavior Being an Historic Compendium of the Rise, Increase, Doctrines, and Deeds of the Jesuits. And on the right here is Uber supposedly handing to a Jesuit priest um, kind of a hand grenade type of thing, a fireball to, to help fight. And if you look at this, boy, they've got a lot going on in this one too. So you've got the Pope, he's sitting here with a bellows, making the wind blow toward London as London burns. You've got Jesuits throwing these fireballs at the world. Uh, you've got one, one priest here and he's got foxes and he's tired, he's tied like fire to their tails. Go into the city, destroy the city. You even have Guy Fox over here. So there's Guy Fox <laughs> getting ready to blow up Parliament. So um, still a lot of propaganda um, going on about what this was. All right, now let's move on to something um, a little better. I want to next talk about the Royal Hospital Chelsea. These are one of two more important events or developments during Charles II's reign that I want to point out. So this one is the Royal Hospital Chelsea. Until the 17th century, the state made no specific provisions for old and injured soldiers. And you remember, before the dissolution of the monasteries, care for the poor and sick was provided by religious foundations. But a lot of that ended after the dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII. So in 1681, responding to the need to look after these old and infirm soldiers, Charles II issued a royal warrant authorizing the building of the Royal Hospital Chelsea to care for those broken by age or war. He employed Christopher Wren um, to, to do the design and erect the building. You can see here on the left, um, this is a nod to Charles II. I don't know why I didn't get a good picture of the front of Charles, but here he is again uh, in the courtyard here and he is dressed as a Roman emperor. Again, this is a very popular thing at that time. So you can see him, he's the, the patron of this. Wren built a beautiful chapel, gorgeous chapel, within the grounds. And there's just a couple of pictures. And today, about 300 Army veterans live at the Royal Hospital, including those who have served in the Falklands, Cyprus, Northern Ireland. I don't think there are many left from World War II, if any, or Korea, uh, but uh, later, um, later conflicts as well. Any former soldier of the British Army over the age of 65 who is facing spending their advanced years alone, they can apply for residence here as in what's called an in-pensioner living in, in, on the grounds. The grounds, the dining hall, and Wren's Chapel are all open for self-guided tours. So on the left here, you see two of these pensioners in their very distinctive scarlet red coats. Um, I stay in Chelsea. This is actually, this picture is actually, was taken at the Chelsea Flower Show a few years ago because the Chelsea Flower Show is held on the grounds um, of the hospital. And uh, if you walk around Chelsea, I stay in Chelsea when I'm in London, you can sometimes see these guys out on the streets just kind of walking around. But here they are, you know, at the flower show. And then on the right is a model of one of the births that they, one of their rooms, if you will. So the original births that were designed by Wren, they were very small. They were only like six feet, six feet by six feet. And until the early 20th century, they had no lighting at all. In 1991, they were enlarged to nine square feet. In 2015, there were further renovations that took place. Um, and for the first time since 1692, all of the pensioners now have their own bedroom, study space, and an ensuite shower room facility. The dining hall is quite lovely. Uh, you can also tour this as long as they're not eating lunch. I got in here right before lunchtime, so I got to uh, 
get a picture of one of the menus, but just a gorgeous, gorgeous facility. And that was the menu for the day that uh, I was in there. They already had everything set up for lunch that day. So they eat quite well. It's a nice, very nice diet. A lot of them have their own little um, buggies that they ride around in. And I, I had to get a picture of this because I thought it was quite funny that Bobby T had quite a blinged up little buggy and was quite proud of it, obviously. So he had his name on it to make sure nobody nobody stole it. So if, you, if you're if you in London again, if you're over by Chelsea, go over and visit. It's well worth a visit. And they've also got a little museum, a um, nice, nice place to visit. All right. Another thing I wanted to talk about before we got to architecture was the Great Frost. Um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, there were many harsh winters. The Thames froze over several times. It was said that Henry VIII actually traveled from central London to Greenwich by sleigh on the river in 1536. Queen Elizabeth I used to go out on the ice frequently. Uh, but with these harsh winters, obviously came famine and death. Nonetheless, the Londoners said, we're going to make the most of this. So they started setting up frost fairs on the river. And between 1607 and 1814, there were seven major fairs and lots of smaller ones. The first one was recorded in 1607-08. Uh, at that time, they had football pitches, bowling matches, shops, food stalls, pubs, everything you would see on a busy London street. During the great frost here of 1683-84, this was considered the mini ice age. The Thames completely froze for two months. The ice reached a thickness of 11 inches. The shops, they had tents with shops in them. The shopkeepers would actually set fire, might make little fires uh, to keep warm. That's how thick the ice was. So the, the fire was not going to melt the ice. There were coaches driven up and down the Thames. There was a bull baiting ring. You can see a couple of these rings as we talked about in the Tudor period. So blood sports, horse and carriage uh, rides and races, puppet shows, people were getting drunk. There were pubs, every, anything and everything. There was one guy who was a very enterprising printer uh, by the name of Croom. He was selling souvenir cards and you could get your name put on it, the date, and the fact that the card was printed on the Thames on the ice to prove you were there. But the cold weather did have devastating um, circumstances. The diarist John Evelyn spoke of waterfowl, birds, and animals dying. Plant life was dying. Sources of fuel became very expensive, so there were contributions made to help the poor. And due to the cold air, smoke was unable to rise out of the atmosphere, and that caused a really big smog, smoggy conditions. There's another uh, picture of a frost fair, um, another painting. The final one started in 1814. It lasted for four days. They said at that time an elephant was led across the river below Blackfriars Bridge. Now, what caused these this phenomenon to end? Well, uh, milder climate, as we know. The reconstruction of London Bridge, it had wider arches, so that allowed the tide to flow more freely um, underneath there. Uh, and find the water to, to, to go more freely. And finally, um, we're going to discuss later in the course, the embankment of the river during the 19th century, this made the river deeper and narrower. So there are several factors why you no longer see the Thames totally freezing over or for such a vast area. Sometimes there's still little spots, not in London usually, um, but you don't see this phenomenon any longer. All right, I want to quickly go through architecture. I mentioned um, Charles I being held at St. James Palace before his execution. Henry VIII, going back to the Tudors, Henry VIII had several palaces in London in outlying areas. He loved to build palaces. But St. James Palace and Hampton Court are the only ones still standing. And of those two, St. James is the only one within London. Henry built this on the site of a leper hospital dedicated to St. James the Less, hence the name. And it was secondary in, in importance only to the palace of Whitehall for most of the Tudor and Stuart monarchs. In fact, Charles II and his brother James were both born here at St. James. The palace increased in importance during the reign of the early Georgian monarchy, um, but it was later displaced by when Buckingham Palace was built. So it's no longer uh, a principal residence of, of the monarch or um, most of the royal family. There, there are some apartments that are still kept here. I think Princess Anne has an apartment for when she's in London, she stays here. For a short time uh, after his divorce, Prince Charles lived here with his two sons um, for a short time after his divorce. But it's quite splendid to look at. If you go down the street, it's just, it's right around the corner from right near um, Buckingham Palace. 
and it's really hits you in the face with its Tudor splendor. This one's quite interesting too. This is in High Holborn. Uh, this building can be traced back to 1292 when it was used as a market. Uh, Staple Inn, it uh, specialized in wool. Staple referred to a wool duty, hence the name. From 1415, it was used by lawyers and became one of the inns of chancery. Uh, and in the 16th century, it was a center for providing legal training and it became associated with Gray's Inn, one of the four inns of court. Today, it's the only surviving inn of chancery in London. In 1580, the building was extended and a new hall was built. It did narrowly, narrowly escape the Great Fire of London, but it, there was a fire in 1756 and it needed restoration after that. In 1936, uh, the building front was restored after 350 years, so this is not the original building front. And then further restoration work was undertaken following bomb damage in 1944. The hall was refurbished in 1996. Um, if you peek in the windows, <laughs> you can see there are still some original furnishings and stained glass. But you can see on the street level, there are uh, retail shops, but they have to, their signs uh, have to be muted in kind of in keeping with the design of, of the building. St. Bartholomew's. We went to St. Bartholomew's, the great church, a couple of weeks ago. Well, as you enter into the churchyard to go into the church, you walk through a medieval arch. And that arch was part of the southern aisle of the church. And again, if I expand this, fortunately, my picture is a little dark, but you can see that arch there. Um, so the arch is there. And on top of the arch, in 1595, this Tudor gatehouse was built. And on top of the gatehouse, you can see this little statue up here. This is St. Bartholomew all the way up at the top. Um, beautiful gatehouse. But in the 18th century, a Georgian facade was built over the Tudor timber. And it wasn't until bomb damage from a German Zeppelin uh, in 1917 that the original frontage was revealed. That it's like, oh, there's a Tudor, Tudor building under here. It was fully restored in 1932. It's now grade two listed, so it cannot be touched or, or altered in, in any way that's gonna make it look different. Um, but again, it's quite, you walk through it. Um, this is going into the churchyard. This is coming out of the churchyard. So something quite, quite splendid. So a little piece of Tudor history saved. The George Inn, this originally dated to 1542. This is in Southwark. So this is on the south side of the river. Uh, it was later rebuilt in 1677 after it burned down. The original one burned down. It's the only surviving galleried London coaching inn. And it was said that Dickens visited here when it was a coffee house. And the inn is mentioned in his novel, Little Dorrit. And you can go today, they have a pub down here where you can go in, a bar, you know, pub where you can go in and get some food and get something to drink. Unfortunately, I could not cut out these ugly garbage cans that were uh, there at that time but it's still, it's the only galleried in surviving coaching in in London. And that brings us to St. Paul's. So in 604, um, the original, the first of the original St. Paul's cathedrals was built. Um, it was very small, simple structure, stood there till 962. It was destroyed by fire and rebuilt. And it was destroyed again in 1086. Um, and at that time, the Normans said, we are going to build a massively beautiful, the largest cathedral in all of um, all of Christendom. We want we want this huge. We're going big. The vast new building took over two hundred years to complete. There was another fire in eleven thirty six, so that kind of disrupted the work and slowed things down for a while. Um, and the new cathedral was not consecrated until twelve forty. It took a long time. It was the largest building in medieval Britain. And it had this amazing steeple. The steeple um, dominated the skyline line of London for, for centuries, and it provided a landmark for ships navigating the river. But in June of 1561, the steeple was struck by lightning during a storm, and it was destroyed. And they could never raise enough funds to replace the steeple. They did raise money from taxes on Londoners, from clergy in the diocese who gave money. Elizabeth I gave gifts um, and supplied timber. So they were able to keep the, the little tower, the little stub that the steeple was sitting on, but they were never able to rebuild the steeple. So this is what it looked like in its heyday. And this is what it looked like after the uh, steeple was hit. So you can see just that little kind of stub sitting there. It did not have the, 
didn't have that. And then that brings us to Wren's Cathedral. Now I said, the Great Fire destroyed the medieval cathedral. Um, this is the only great cathedral of the early modern age to have been designed and completed by a single architect, Christopher Wren. It's also exceptionally well documented. Uh, all of the building accounts, the contracts, the records of the rebuilding commission, all of these survive along with about 290 original design drawings. So lots and lots of information uh, that we still have for this. I do a four week course on um, London churches uh, and we go into a lot more detail in that course um, on this cathedral than I have time to do today. But you know, a little bit about Wren. Um, he was actually, as I said, you know, he was a scientist, he was a designer, he was an architect, he was a professor of uh, astronomy at Gresham College, also at Oxford University, founder of the Royal Society of London. There's so much I could say about this man. He was he was quite brilliant. But he was even um, he was tasked with okay, build a new structure for this, um, and he was very interested in this. But even before the fire he had already begun working on the old cathedral. So he started designing additional interiors in the old cathedral. And he already had started planning the construction of a dome in order to replace that old spire. So construction on this one started in 1675. It took over 35 years. By 1716, the total cost amounted to $208 million in today's money. It's smaller than the medieval church that it replaced, but it's no one can deny it's an absolute masterpiece. It's 515 feet long, 242 feet wide, 365 feet high. In fact, it was the tallest building in London until the construction of the BT Tower in the early 1960s. Here's a model, if you go in the church, um, this is a model not of the present day cathedral, but one that Wren wanted originally. He wanted a Greek cross model. And in his plan, the altar would have sat right underneath this, this amazing dome. But clergy wanted, no, I want, the, they wanted the traditional Latin cross with the long transepts on each side. And they wanted to have the uh, altar at the, at the east end. So he didn't get his way on that, but we still have the model of what he wanted to originally have it look like. The beautiful west front with these, these Baroque towers on each side. The dome, the dome is amazing. It's got a diameter of 101 feet. It's uh, 364 feet high. It's the second largest cathedral dome in the world. It weighs about 65,000 tons. St. Peter's in Rome is higher and wider, but this one um, is a good rival for it. And I wanted to draw your attention to this phoenix. This is over this, the south transept um, pediment here, or the pediment here over the south transept. Wren commissioned a carving of a phoenix rising from the flames, right? Rising from the fire uh, of London. And in Latin, if you translate this, it says, I rise again and come up again. And of course, the beautiful nave. If you don't want to fight the crowds taking a tour in here, uh, almost every, I think, five or six days a week, they have even song at 5 p.m. You can go in, sit right under that beautiful dome, go to a little service, listen to some beautiful music, and look around you. I'm not going to say much about um, Whitehall Palace, but you've heard me mention this. This originally was um, built by a, a Archbishop of York named Walter de Grey. He built it um, sometime right after 1240, and he called it York Place because he was the Bishop of York. But then Cardinal Woolsey, who was Lord Chancellor under Henry VIII, he took possession of it um, as Archbishop and he expanded it greatly. Um, he rivaled any of Henry's palaces, which Henry did not like. Uh, Woolsey had, was very big into uh, um, grand, you know, grandiose things. So Henry wasn't too happy about that. Um, Henry wasn't happy with Woolsey for a lot of reasons, including the fact he could not secure his divorce um, from Catherine of Aragon. So Woolsey was um, taken from power in 1530, and while he was at it, Henry kicked, not only kicked him out of uh, power, but decided, I'm going to take your, take your palace while I'm at it. So he did, and it became uh, a royal residence um, to replace Westminster Palace, because Westminster Palace had been gutted by fire in 1512. So Henry moved in here, he redesigned it, he expanded it even further, he put in a bowling green, an indoor tennis court, um, a tilt yard for jousting, he spent millions in today's currency. He married two of his wives here, his second wife, Anne Boleyn, and his third wife, Jane Seymour, and he died here himself in January of 1547. 
he had a little, uh, he had plays going on in here. So in 1611, uh, the palace hosted the first known performance of William Shakespeare's The Tempest. It remained a residence of monarchs from the time of Henry VIII until it burned down on January 4th, 1698. Uh, and you can see what it had looked like at the time. It was vast, huge. Um, there's still a couple remnants that you can see or not see in some cases. This is Henry VIII's wine cellar. This is actually uh, the, the area around here. Henry renamed the palace from York Place to Whitehall. And that whole area is now called Whitehall. The road is Whitehall. And this is where a lot of government buildings sit today. Um, so you can see fragments of Henry VIII's tennis court in the cabinet office, if they open it up for tours, which they hardly ever do. Um, and then you can also see his wine cellar. This is under the Ministry of Defense. And once a year, London has an open house weekend in September. Very hard to, to get tickets for, very long lines. But this was open one year. This is not my photo, obviously. Um, it was open one year for people to peek into. What you can see is um, Queen Mary's Riverside Terrace and Steps on the Victoria Embankment in the Victoria Embankment Gardens. These were built by Sir Christopher Wren for Queen Mary II in 1691. And they led from a terrace that you can see here that was in front of the then apartments. And the stairs went right down to the river. The river is not here now. So this again shows you how much that river was, um, had an embankment put in and how narrow the river is compared to what it used to be. But you could come down these steps and get right into her royal barge. Last thing that I wanna get to is Banqueting House because I mentioned this before. This is the only remaining component of the Palace of Whitehall that really survives today, um, that you can really still see the whole thing of. This was the third one built. It was built between 1619 and 1622 by James I at a cost of about four point, or five, sorry, five, I think $5.4 million in today's money. He hired uh, a guy named Inigo Jones um, to build this. Inigo Jones was the son of a, a London carpenter. He was very skilled at costume and scenery design, and he was a great architect. Again, he traveled uh, like Wren had through France and Italy. So he was influenced by the architecture of, of um, ancient Rome and of the Renaissance. And he worked for both James I and James I's son, Charles I. And if you go in here, the ceiling is amazing. It's the only surviving in situ ceiling painting by Flemish artist, Sir Peter Paul Rubens. Um, most likely we think they were commissioned, these panels were commissioned by Charles I around 1629, 1630. There are three major canvases on the ceiling here uh, and they pay honor to his father, James I. Ironically, this was one of the last sites that Charles I would have seen as he was heading to his execution because he came through here and the scaffolding he stood out on, he stepped out onto um, to be beheaded, was built out of the window. Um, a scaffolding was built up high, so it wasn't on the ground, it was up high out of this window um, from, from this hall. A couple more pictures of the ceiling. I love this, you go in here, um, the, the real centerpiece is the ceiling, of course, as you can see, but they've got bean bags, and you can kind of lay down on the bean bags or sit on the bean bags, and they've got mirrors, so you can kind of hold the mirror up, see the reflection, um, and get a look at the ceiling. Okay, so next week we're going to move on to George in London. This was a time of social transformation, huge social transformation, as well as a period of enormous growth in architecture uh, and civil engineering, as we'll talk about. And we're also going to visit a very unique area of London that it's getting a little more popular now with tourists, um, but I still think few tourists, particularly American tourists, go here. And it's called Spitalfields. And it's one of the best places to see some amazingly authentic, not the Jane Austen Georgian architecture you're used to, but this type of Georgian architecture, which is really, if the, if the cars weren't on the streets and there wasn't graffiti scattered around various places, you could be smack in the middle of Georgian London here. So that's what we're going to do next week. I am now going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to turn my camera on and look first at any questions in chat. Yes, yes, Peter reminded us of the uh, um, of that little poem. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Um, 
And yeah, the Thames, the, the ice um, was influenced by the tide. Again, the biggest influence really came from the fact that um, you had the river was narrow, it was wide. Um, the, 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 the way London Bridge, which you're going to talk about soon, um, do your presentation. Um, the way London Bridge was built, the, the river, you know, the water flowed differently under there. Um, so a lot of it really was down to climate change very slowly over, and they were in a mini ice age. There was still, I think in the 19, when did I read? I think in the 1960s, there was still a part of the Thames that froze over, but not in London. It was down near Windsor, I think, that it froze over. So now it's just so narrow. It's, it's so, so much more narrower than it was. It's not narrow, but much narrower than it was and much um, deeper. Uh, and that kind of with climate change really changed everything. But yeah, the tide, where the tide would have affected it more, I think is going under London Bridge where those arches were and, and how that- Yeah, Win Windsor is non-tidal. That's right. And that's, that's the other the thing. thing. The yeah, that's it. London is, I mean, the river, the Thames is very, very long and the whole thing is not tidal. Only certain sections of it are tidal. But um, yeah, so they, they now they still have, I did have to laugh though, because I'm on a lot of mailing lists for different London events and London things. And they were having a frost fair, I think last week or the week before, obviously not on the river. But they've decided to revive a frost fair by doing things on the street, I think on the South Bank or something, and they were calling it the frost fair. Um, and they did have some pretty frosty weather um, earlier in January. I think it's warmed up again, but it was it was kind of cold. But yeah, yeah, you're right, though. It's not the whole river is not tidal. Um, only parts of it are tidal. But quite, quite amazing that they, well, it wasn't that many years ago. Now, you know, part of Cuga Lake froze over at one end at this, at this end of Cuga Lake. And I remember going down to Stewart Park and seeing people quite a distance out into the water um, on the ice with sleds and things. And I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I would trust that. <laughs> but they were out there and a lot, a lot, I've got pictures. A lot of people were out there. But yeah, this was this was quite a phenomenon at that time and quite popular again until it all switched in the 1800s. And I'm sure part of it was basal jets, uh, which we'll talk about when we get to the Victorians, um, the embankment, the new sewer system, the narrowing of the of the river. Your your picture of the plague. Mm -hmm. A uh, rising of the lights. That was a lung, I believe that was a lung disease. Oh, okay. I believe the lights were the lungs. I'm pretty, oh. sure, I'm pretty sure that's what that was. Yeah. That was, but, that was uh, your picture of the plague. On the right hand side, there were some military men with pikes. Were they preventing the walking people from entering London? Or were they preventing them from leaving? Or from leaving? It was both. You had to have, they weren't letting people in and you had to have a pass to get out. Um, so they were really trying to contain it. So they did have the military there. They had, they had um, enforcements there to keep people from coming in and to keep people unless they had a pass from getting out. And then of course, to get back in, you had to have a pass to prove you lived there. You know, you had to, yeah, to prove that you were a Londoner to get in. Yeah, but it was interesting because there were a lot of parallels to today. You know, not a lot has changed. I mean, we all went into lockdown. Everything closed. Um, we were told to quarantine, you know, stay home. Um, so there were there were some parallels to today. And even watching, you know, the bills of mortality, I say they're kind of like, or again, if you recall, um, for the first year or at least year here in Ithaca, well, other places too, you could go to the you could go to the CDC website, you could go to the WHO, you could go to New York State and see how many cases of COVID, how many people had died, how many hospitalizations. It was, that hasn't changed that much. You know, the same kind of thing. They were tracking it more or less in the same way to try to figure out where it was spreading, how fast it was spreading, that kind of thing. Uh, the Puritan military desecrated a lot of the churches and cathedrals throughout the country. But you sort of indicated they didn't get into London because London had its defenses. Did they get well, London in? Was, London was the Puritans. Those were the parliamentarians. Okay, so I the see. Royalists. It was the royalists. Right. Who, yeah, they held right. up the royalists. It was the, uh, is there any evidence that they destroyed statues in the London churches? They didn't, what they did do, not, not statues that I know of, although, well, they did, they did damage the churches. They used St. Paul's 
was used to stable horses and um you know so there was damage done but not the way it was done um out in other areas where as, as you're right you know they i mean they broke all the windows they um damaged that they destroyed the statues they they um destroyed graves they destroyed graves a lot of the anglo-saxon kings um and and i think even well, not so much the medieval ones, because most of the medieval ones are at, at Westminster, but I think the very early ones, some of their graves were destroyed, their bodies were dug up, you know, so there's some of them we don't even know uh, where they are now, because they were badly desecrated. I do know there was damage to churches, but I do not believe it was on the scale that it was in the outlying areas, um, because, because in part, um, in part, London was loyal to the parliamentarians. London always knew how to play their hand. <laughs> they knew how to protect themselves, you know, and, and these guys had the upper hand. So they're like, okay, you know, and I think where they were meeting more resistance is where they were probably, I mean, part of it was a religious thing, obviously, but I think part of it was also, we're going to show you our force, you know, because we're the ones that are in charge. You can't resist us. So, so what, was, what was that great wall built for then to keep the royalists out? Keep the royalists out. They were afraid the royalists oh. get back in. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was for. It was to keep the royalists from coming because Charles had decamped out to Oxford, and you know, and they did go back and forth. I mean, there were what three civil wars in that time period, and Charles gained ground, and then the parliamentarians gained ground, and they went back and forth. So there was very real fear, of course, that you know he was going to come back and and try to take London. So yeah, they. They wanted to be prepared. They wanted to be prepared. Other questions or comments or thoughts? I always feel so much smarter after one of your presentations, Deb. <laughs> well, thank you. And it lasts about an hour or so. <laughs> I've been going a little over lately, I have to say. I was I, No, no, no. I just meant the my the my oh, I feel your you brain. Know. Well, hey, don't worry about it. There are times when, believe me, what's what's tricky for me is one time I was teaching two things at once and um I found myself one day in the middle of a lecture and my brain just froze because my brain suddenly went to the other class I was teaching. I'm like, oh God, stop, stop. <laughs> stop before you say something wrong. But uh yeah, it's um well, you've got the readings, so you can go back and look at the readings. And as I said, you know, I, I did something um, on the Stuarts. You you attended that, I think. Um, so there are several YouTube videos up under the Love Living at Home website that if you're curious to go into more details on any of these, there is some more detail in some of those. But also, I always also try to say, if you want, you know, I, I throw up some readings there and some web links and stuff just to give you a little more background. But if you want more, just shoot me an email, you know, go and go into the membership directory or ask the office and they'll they'll contact me. I've got all kinds of book recommendations and uh, it's hard. It's hard because I have all kinds of scholarly material. But the problem is you have to be affiliated with Cornell to access those articles. They're not because of licensing things. So I can't send those out to people because they're not open to anybody who is not affiliated with Cornell. So it's always a little tricky to find accessible readings that aren't too fluffy um, that people can read, you know, that I can that I can share. But I'm happy to share um, anything else you want as well. So just yeah, just let me know if you want more on any of this. Like I said, I geek out. So like the bills of mortality, I think I put something on the reading list about here's the link to the like. Not anyone else is not going to want to read these things, but I love reading them. I'm like, wow, this is oh, I think they're fascinating. I, I think they're absolutely fascinating. Yeah. 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 And there is, and, and I, if you really want to read them, let me know. I will send you, I do have a glossary someplace that explains all those weird little terminologies, like the rising of the lights and things that tell you what all those things mean. And Peter's doing a special presentation for us on London Bridge. Yep, at the end of February. And is it falling down, Peter, or not? You know? <laughs> it it <laughs> fell down. Not the current <laughs> one. I think even the current one may have problems, but uh, that that was a bridge that was uh, the song was about the bridge that was eventually demolished at the end of the 1700s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the last one, the well, I don't want to. I'm not going to step on your presentation. Never mind. You can talk about what happened to the last one. Yeah, um, well, that one was, that was falling down as well. Yeah. <laughs> they all do eventually. Um, other questions or comments? Um, yeah, well, I do. Do you know the song "Oranges and Lemons"? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is that about the plague? I think it is. I believe it is. Um, I'll have to go back and check. But yeah, I think I think it is about the plague. Ring around the rosy is. Yeah. yeah I do. I show you all fall down. Yeah. 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 But I think that one is as well. Um, Oranges and lemons is a pretty, it's a children's rhyme, but it's pretty gruesome. It ends yeah. up with heads being chopped off. A lot of these, a lot of these children's rhymes uh, have deeper meanings. I mean, think about Grimm's fairy tales, for God's sakes, those things are horrific. <laughs> I mean, yeah. those are the fairy tales, but yeah, no, actually, yeah, that is kind of a gruesome one as well. Um, yeah, and what was the one? Oh, gosh. I wasn't Humpty really Dumpty is about Richard the Third, right? I think so. Oh, I and thought it was it, about Donald Trump. Oh, well. <laughs> and then there's the one. What is the one? Um, oh, Mary, Mary, quite contrary. It was supposedly about Mary the First um, killing. Oh. The kids, I think. I think that. How was does her. your garden grow with silver bells and cockle shells? In? Yeah, there was something in there. I think there was something in there. I, I, I don't know. There's, there's, yeah, a lot of them have a very interesting double, double meaning hidden behind these supposed, uh, yeah. And some yeah. have slightly changed crossing the Atlantic because in Britain it's ring a ring a roses, not right. ring a ring a rosy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. I don't know why that changed. Music changes too. Um, well, there's a couple of Christmas carols that the tunes are different in Britain than they are. Oh in yeah. What was well, there, with some of the carols, there's two ver two versions to the music. Yeah. A little town of Bethlehem is yes, one. that's one of them. That's one of them. Yep. I yep. just heard one the other day that was. Uh, I said that's not that song. <laughs> yeah. The first I remember the first time being at a Christmas service in Suffolk uh in england way back oh gosh i don't know when that was late 80s and we went to this carol service candlelight carol service which was lovely um i went with my friends and we had our little song sheets and we start to sing and i start you know booming out whatever it was and we're everybody's singing a different tune <laughs> with the same same song same words but i'm like um we're not all singing from the same hymn book as they say. <laughs> Those um, Yanks overpaid and over here. <laughs> overpaid and over here. Oversex, overpaid and over here. That's what they said yeah. during the war. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was that was the first time I ran into that. I'm like, oh, okay. That's didn't know that. Other comments or questions. <sighs> okay. Well, once again, I took us over the time. I'm sorry. Um but uh, there's always so much to cover and so hard to cut things out. So next week, we will move on to the Georgians. And Betsy, you were asking.